This plane with no wings taught NASA how to land from space. In the early 1970s, over the Mojave Desert, a squat rocket-powered metal pod called the X-24 dove toward the runway at over 110 meters per second with no second chance to pull up. By the time its wheels touched the concrete at Edwards Air Force Base, all of the X-24's propellant was gone. The aircraft was unpowered for the entire final approach, gliding on a lift-to-drag ratio as low as 3 to 1, where an airliner uses around 15 to 1. Every degree of bank angle, every extra second in a turn, removed meters of altitude from a budget that had been calculated on the ground hours earlier. This was not just another X-plane experiment, it was a live test of a problem that would define reusable spaceflight for decades. But the question was, could it be possible to take a vehicle that falls back from orbit at roughly Mach 25, survive peak heating where surface temperatures reach over 1,500 degrees Celsius, and still arrive at the runway with just enough lift left to land? Ballistic capsules solved that by splashing into the ocean with parachutes, landing tens of kilometers from their target and requiring recovery fleets stretching over thousands of square kilometers. The United States wanted something different for its next generation of spacecraft, and for that, they focused on a family of strange wingless aircraft called lifting bodies. The setting was the late 1960s in the middle of the Cold War and the Apollo program. At Edwards Air Force Base, NASA and the U.S. Air Force were already flying exotic vehicles like the X-15 to altitudes over 80,000 meters and speeds above Mach 6. On the ground, engineers were sketching concepts for reusable space planes that would take off under rocket power, orbit the Earth, and then return to land on a runway less than 100 meters wide. To do that reliably, they needed hard data on how lifting shapes behaved when they were no longer at hypersonic speeds, but still flying with very poor glide ratios. This was the gap the X-24 program was supposed to close. The core problem was simple to write down, but harsh in numbers. A lifting body re-entering from orbit carries a fixed amount of energy defined by its mass and velocity. By the time it drops into the lower atmosphere, most of that energy has been dumped as heat into the shock layer, where structural heating can drive metal well above 500 degrees Celsius. Existing data came from scale models in wind tunnels and a handful of subscale drops, but none captured the full flight profile. Supersonic to transonic to subsonic, flown by a human pilot rather than a fixed control law, and with landing speeds around 110 to 120 meters per second, instead of the 70 to 80 meters per second of typical transport jets. A misjudged flare of 2 to 3 meters would mean touching down hard at vertical rates over 2 meters per second, enough to damage landing gear and airframes in a reusable vehicle. The margin for error was so small that scale tests weren't enough, and engineers needed real data from a full-scale craft. Earlier lifting bodies like the M2F2 had already revealed how unforgiving this regime could be. The M2F2, a 6.8-meter-long lifting body, had rolled out of control and crashed on landing in 1967 after sideslip exceeded the limits predicted in wind tunnel tests. Impact forces climbed far beyond safe thresholds, injuring the pilot and forcing a redesign. That accident showed that small misalignments in control authority could cross stability boundaries where roll and yaw coupled uncontrollably. Engineers needed a new configuration that would both explore this regime and build in better margins, and the X-24 was their answer. Instead of a pure wedge or half cone, the X-24A used a bulbous, almost teardrop fuselage about 7 meters long and 4 meters wide, with small vertical fins and control surfaces at the rear. The basic idea was to let the body itself generate lift by deflecting airflow downward over its curved upper surface, while the fins and elevons handled pitch, roll, and yaw. The aircraft was powered by a liquid rocket engine fed by onboard tanks sized for a burn of roughly 150 to 200 seconds. That burn would push the vehicle from subsonic release speeds near Mach 0.7 up past Mach 1.5 and altitudes above 21,000 meters before shutdown. Flight operations followed a strict procedure. A modified B-52 bomber carried the X-24 under its wing to drop altitude, typically around 13,000 to 14,000 meters. 
At release, the lifting body separated, stabilized, and the pilot ignited the rocket. Once the burn ended, the X-24 coasted upward, trading kinetic for potential energy until vertical velocity decayed to zero near its planned apogee. From that point forward, every meter of altitude and every meter per second of airspeed had to be managed down to a precise flare point on the runway. Early tests revealed that the X-24A's rounded underside and fin layout produced adequate lift and stability at moderate angles of attack around 10 to 15 degrees, but became more difficult to manage as the pilot demanded higher lift near landing. Telemetry from the first set of flights recorded oscillations in pitch and roll rates that were still within structural limits, but larger than the design team wanted for operational landings. The data made it clear that while the concept worked, the shape could be improved for the final, critical phase of flight. Inside the design offices, engineers broke the problem into measurable pieces. Lift coefficient versus angle of attack needed to rise quickly enough to support a controlled flare within about 15 to 20 meters of the runway, but not so sharply that the aircraft suddenly stalled. The turning point came when the team decided to do more than just tweak the existing airframe. They redesigned the X-24A into the X-24B, effectively machining a new shape from the same structural core. Instead of a bulbous body, the X-24B adopted a sharp, triangular planform with a flat bottom. This redistributed pressure over a broader area, increasing the lift-to-drag ratio by roughly 10 to 20% at approach conditions while also improving directional stability. It transformed the same underlying vehicle into a new testbed with significantly better handling near the ground. Flight testing restarted cautiously. Initial unpowered glide tests kept release altitudes conservative, closer to 9,000 to 10,000 meters, with target landing speed still around 110 meters per second to keep conditions comparable to the A model. Pilots reported more predictable roll response and better tracking in the final turn from base to final. Data showed reduced side-slip excursions. These early successes justified returning to full rocket-powered profiles with higher apogees and longer glides. However, not everything went smoothly. On some flights, energy management still ran tight, with touchdown points drifting hundreds of meters down the runway compared to the planned aim point. Atmospheric density variations of only a few percent at 10,000 to 15,000 meters created enough difference in drag to force pilots to adjust their flare timing by fractions of a second. Across dozens of flights, the X-24 program accumulated a detailed data set of how lifting bodies handled from transonic down to low subsonic speeds. Engineers correlated angle of attack schedules with measured lift coefficients, validating that even with no traditional wings, the vehicles could maintain controlled flight at approach angles between 10 degrees and 20 degrees. These findings translated directly into design decisions for the Space Shuttle. The Shuttle Orbiter ultimately used a more conventional delta wing rather than a pure lifting body shape, but its low lift-to-drag ratio at re-entry, around 4.5 to 1, meant it approached landing with similar tight energy margins. The X-24 data informed how much cross-range the shuttle could safely claim. The one-shot nature of lifting body landings reinforced the requirement that shuttle approaches be fully autonomous in energy management, but still piloted in the final segment. A small, stubby rocket aircraft falling away from a B-52 over Edwards Air Force Base did not look like a revolution. Yet, in its low lift numbers, steep descent angles, and unforgiving energy margins lay the blueprint for runway landings from orbit. The X-24 turned a counterintuitive idea, a plane without wings, into a validated capability, and left behind a data set that still defines how engineers think about lifting bodies and the final minutes of flight back to Earth. However, not every high-speed experiment ended in a quiet success like this. A decade before lifting bodies mapped out precise low-energy landings, engineers built a gigantic bomber designed to cruise above Mach 3, bend its own wingtips into the shockwave, and ride that compressed air for extra lift. It was so fast that its paint peeled off the fuselage, and yet it vanished after only a few tests. Click the video on your screen to see what happened to that aircraft and why a machine built to outrun everything never made it into service.